Welcome to Elixir Mix, your weekly Elixir podcast talking with members of the community. My name is Mark Erickson, and on our panel today, we have Eric Ostrich. Hello. Josh Adams. Hey. Michael Reese. Currently drawing 150 milliamps. And today we're uh, joined with a special guest, Frank Hunleth. Frank, uh, we're glad to have you back. It's been a long time since you've been on, uh, and you are in a big kind of force in the Elixir community. You are uh, kind of the head of the, I think you started the NERVS project and I would love to, we're glad to have you back on and say hi. So I'm, I'm, hi, I'm glad to be back. Uh, just to add on that. So Justin Schneck and I both, we co-authored NERVS. So I did just to uh, um, add to that, I did start it, but Justin came in um, and uh, really um, added a lot of, to the Elixir tooling. This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So, if you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. We have had both you and Justin on at one time, uh, which was a very early episode of ours. Uh, and so I'm, I'm glad that we're able to have at least you back. Yep. Um, yes, and I've been very impressed with uh, the things Justin's been doing uh, uh, in terms of speaking and talking about Nerves Hub. We'd love to get some updates on what's going on in the Nerves community. And so why don't we just kind of get a little background for people who may be new to Nerves or are, are not going to go back and listen to that older episode with you. Uh, just kind of... Tell us how you got started with NERVS and where did this come from? Right, right. So where NERVS came from, NERVS came from my desire to use the Erlang VM um, in some projects that I was working on, some embedded projects. So these were pretty low powered ARM based systems. And my problem or the, the issue that I ran into was that it was, it looked like it was going to be easy to put Erlang onto the system at the beginning, but then it got harder. So NERVS was the project where to I would started accumulating all the uh, tooling and the uh, fixes that I had made. Um, I mean, I tried to contribute things back when I could, but uh, there's a lot of other things outside of Erlang that you need to do to get to it running well on an embedded system. And most of the examples out there had been kept internal. So it started there. And then uh, that was Erlang, all Erlang times. And then um, at some point, uh, Garth Hitchens and uh, Justin Schneck got involved to, and they really loved, uh, they really loved Elixir. So that uh, I switched to Elixir and there's been no looking back. So just for full disclosure, Erlang totally works. It totally works. So does LFE, so does all the other Beam languages on Elixir. And I find it uh, a lot of fun to use the other languages. But of course, you'll, if you look at most of our code, it will be in Elixir. So one thing I would love to hear a little bit more about, you've probably said this lots of times, but for people who are new to nerves, what would make an embedded systems programmer want to use the Erlang VM? And so the Erlang VM has a lot of interesting things going for it. But so the, in the embedded systems world, some of the things that are very important are reliability. You know, a lot of things that, that are important in other fields. Um, uh, reliability, there's a lot of concurrency with the sensors, and especially now with IoT stuff, even on these end systems, uh, they're aggregating a lot of internal sensor data and then shipping up to the internet and whatnot. The, uh, another aspect that's uh, very comfortable to most embedded programmers is just the whole message passing uh, based programming model, the actor model. So it's not the limitations of the embedded device haven't, don't allow programmers to take advantage of it in most languages, but that kind of model for building programs out is, is something that's familiar. The whole, um, I'm using shared memory and semaphores is something that is well known to be not a great way of build programs on the embedded side, but you do it anyway because uh, that's that's what you're given. Sometimes the platform just forces you into those uh, um, situations for for performance. 
So it has a lot of things going for it. The uh, uh, what I what pulled me over was uh, at the time I was working on a voice over IP switch, which had a ton of concurrency, and uh, we had to um, reliability was a big concern. So we looked into different ways of, of building this out, and this was a C and C plus plus group. We built our own things, and after the fact, we looked at what Erlang did and uh, what the, the articles published by Ericsson, and they had such a nicer model for building out their software than what we had um, and fixed a lot of issues. So I think that the overall, the, a lot of the marketing, a lot of the uh, attributes of the Erlang VM really resonate with people. I think the, uh, the hurdle that you have to get over is that it's a big system to pull in, and that's the goal of NERVS was to make it a little bit smaller of a hump to, to uh, be able to integrate in your work. All right, so that was a lot. Uh, in there, you did mention that uh, you had other Beam languages that you liked using, and so I wanted to see if you would go a little bit into that, even though that was meant to just be an internal oh, NERVS, just right. because I'm interested. Yeah, so I don't know. Uh, so Josh, you may have seen this. This has been in the Erlang when I used to give presentations at Erlang Factory. I had examples. I had, at one point, my presentation, I had a version of it that was done Erlang, um, and a version that was in Elixir, and a version that was in LFE. And, uh, and I was, I was going to wait till the, the actual uh, presentation to figure out which one I was going to do. Um, so I think that that one turned out to be Elixir. But I have to say, what I've done with that code, um, I've put some of it in the nurse example. So if you actually look back, you can you can see if you want to make an LFE project in NERVS or use it, you can kind of get a start at it. Um, so I don't know if I can go into a lot of depth on actually using like LFE and embedded project, other than to say, it's just, it's just as fun, right? So um, fun and different. Um, I can't say that I do this for work or anything, but uh, um, I like some of the, so those are LFEs that, and um, is the only, Let's see if there's any other ones that I experiment with. Yeah, recently LFE's been the only one that I played around with. Um, I haven't uh, ventured into any of the newer Beam languages. I expect it would be a lot of fun as well. Okay, I'll um, use this as the kick to get me to play with LFE because I haven't <laughs> uh, really ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, it's it's a different experience. I don't know if there's uh, um, a similar list on embedded. Um, kind of platform that has the attributes that Erlang provides. So I think it's interesting um, just from that perspective. Yeah, I wonder how much uh, you could get sort of marketing LFE on nerves to Lisp developers specifically. Yeah, I, I would be curious. It'd certainly be a fun, uh, um, fun thing for someone. I don't know if I could do it, but this is a call for help. Yes, this would definitely be a call for help. Because Somebody that listens to this up. can go, you know what? Yeah, I could make that happen. Yeah, <laughs> and I totally support it. That would be a lot of fun. Well, Frank, I know um, just back in July, you guys had a 1.5 release. Right. And, and with that, so congratulations, you know, uh, to continue shipping and, and keep doing something that is, uh, you know, a labor of love. And uh, I, I imagine this is a rewarding project for you, but I'd love to hear about some of the things that came out in uh, Elixir 1.9. And I know you'd mentioned one of the big features was moving to the new OTP releases. Right, right. So I have to say that the main thing for NERVS 1.5 is the Elixir 1.9 releases. And that was, I think, from the externally, you're probably not going to see too many differences once you switch your project over from distillery to to Elixir 1.9. Inside the internals of nerves, it simplified a lot. Um, and I think it has the potential to keep things simple for us. We, um, with nerves, had, um, we have a simpler view of the releases than what, uh, you, what you get, what's offered in distillery. So being able to um, reduce the scope of, of what we use was uh, helpful to us from a maintenance perspective. But we're really excited about that. And uh, right now, I think it's in a period of transition as we move projects from distillery because there are features that aren't quite there yet, but it's going to get there. Uh, other than that, the, the NERVS 1.5 tooling has been, I think people will find when they upgrade their projects that there are an awful lot of similarities that uh, uh, mostly what we've been doing is bug fixes or improving docs. Some there, there's some error cases that people run into 
that we've been trying to get better error messages in. So those kind of those kinds of things just kind of invisibly get added for most people unless you're um, having a hard time with the tools. Yeah, so so anyway, that's NERVS 1.5. The other piece that we've been working on, which I have to mention, is the whole NERVS hub. Um, that has been a pretty major endeavor for Justin and me and a few others. And that's to build out a firmware update service for nurse based devices. So just rolling back, what we've always had in the past was this SSH-based push. So you could set up your nurse devices. Some people would set them up in a factory and have a script that would just push use SSH to push firmware updates all across the factory to their devices. And that kind of worked, right? It, and certainly for our development, pushing SSH, pushing firmware updates over SSH was, was reasonable. Um, but uh, for large scale deployments, having a centralized service to deliver firmware updates uh, is really what everyone was doing for real. They were just building their own system. So we wanted to uh, consolidate the work that was involved with that to one place. So that was Nerves Hub. And we, so this is just to me, we received a lot of help from um, SmartRent, Latote, uh, Ferry Consultancy. We um, even got some hardware support from Allied uh, Component Works. So a lot of help for building this out. Oh, and also FarmBot um, contributed to this project quite a bit. So the idea is, is that devices can call in to the Nerves Hub server. Um, if there's a release, it will download and update it. If there's not, well, it just continues on. You can also do some lightweight management on it. At any rate, this uh, when you build out a service like this, you you learn about uh, a lot of the details, especially in providing security to these devices and uh, dealing with some of the boundary conditions of, of how companies and individuals would like to distribute updates. So this service, if anyone's interested, this is a um, this, this is a free service. It's in beta to anyone in the maker community. So long as you're not doing a ton of devices, we, we, have, uh, uh, we fund that out of our open collective. And that has been, I think, very beneficial for many people. Then if you are a company, you can, um, you can certainly uh, set up a Nerfs Hub instance. It's all open source um, for uh, if you want to take control of the deployment or if you want to use our service we're going to be announcing uh, some support for that on the corporate side at ElixirConf next week. Yay for ElixirConf. <laughs> or maybe in the past week, depending on when this gets published. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so yes, this will come out um, just after, I believe. Uh, but I did want to drop in the show notes a link to Justin Schneck's uh, ElixirConf uh, keynote last year, where he was kind of really going over Nerves Hub and kind of giving an intro to how it worked with like what you're talking about, the certificates, and how it can be a completely secured and uh, a, a trustable way of deploying software. So I was really excited about that. Right. Yes. Yes. No. We we have made a lot of progress since last year. So I think it's it's in production at several at uh, quite a few companies. Uh, I know uh, a lot of people are using it for their hobby projects now, not bothering with uh, SSH at all. Um, so it's it's nice seeing it develop out into a real system. So uh, I just want to interject here that Frank is one of the people who I'd absolutely want to have build Nerves Hub, but not the person I would choose to do marketing for Nerves Hub. So I'm going to try to give a marketing spin to all the explanation that Frank just gave. So uh, if you have ever wanted something like Kubernetes for your uh, devices, but with like 1% the level of complexity and 85% of the total value prop, that is Nerves Hub. Um, so this thing, it really is a pretty amazing uh, way that you can architect a project. You'll have the ability, for instance, to like designate a group of devices as your test devices. You can ship an update to those, test them, make sure everything's good before sending that same release to the rest of your device farm. You can have devices updating all over the world in different locations. Um, I mean, the set of tooling that is available here, I've never seen anything like this in the open source world before, um, especially around embedded devices. They have traditionally been very uh, closed source. Like it, as an industry, uh, a lot of embedded device manufacturers like to keep things close to the vest. They like to keep things in-house and proprietary. 
Um, and it's really amazing that now somebody, if you have an idea, just a, like a hobby project or an idea for a device that potentially turns into a business, this is a really amazing foundation to build on. And it goes all the way as deep. I'm just going to drop a link to the NERFS key. So this goes all the way down to, hey, can we actually validate that no one else has messed with the bits and bytes that we use to verify the authenticity of a new release? And so there's actually in hardware, like hardware hardened uh, RSA keys that you can attach to your device so that no one can ever mess with the authenticity of that, uh, of your certificate. And you can validate that someone was intending this release for this device. It's pretty, um, really, truly amazing stuff. The team, you know, has been working on this for over a year. Uh, so I, I just want to say that there's like a whole marketing angle here that uh, Frank will describe as fun or interesting or cool and is actually like groundbreaking uh, and, and it opens up the door for a whole bunch of startups to exist. Awesome. Yes, please, Michael, please, uh, please uh, uh, fill in the marketing for me. I super appreciate that. <laughs> So one of the points that Michael made there was how, you know, making the point that this really is a, an open source project. And I, you mentioned a little bit about like some uh, commercial backing or funding that was available, like for ho uh, having hosting available. I'd love to hear a little bit about kind of what the, uh, the funding model is that kind of keeps nerves going and the infrastructure behind it all. All right. So there are a couple um, places where we get funding. Number um, First of all, uh, Justin, Schneck, myself, um, kind of Rigby, we're all funded by our, we're all paid by our companies to work on NERFs um, part-time. Uh, part that helps substantially, as you might imagine. We have an open collective that funds a lot of the hardware that we end up buying. As you imagine, this, this project has a lot of random hardware pieces that we need to purchase. And it is, it can get a, it can get a little expensive if we just keep on going over to Micro Center or Adafruit and ordering things. So that uh, helps out tremendously on that. Um, the Open Collective also helps out on, on, the, on paying for the maker, hobbyist, enthusiast uh, users on Nerfs Hub. Then the other part of this is the, there, it has been, there is some corporate backing of Nerfs Hub for people who want to use Nerfs Hub for their projects. So for example, SmartRent um, and Latote. You know, but uh, on the so nerves hubs is really where the expense expenses start adding up because it's a service, uh, and some companies like those companies I just mentioned they'll use the uh, open the one that we run the service we run and help uh, finance that. Uh, other companies and particular ones that I've had in the past will just run instances themselves like they don't want to deal. Uh, this deal with any problems that might not be they want to have everything under control. That's, that's what it comes down to. So what's going to be, or what will be announced at Elixir Comp will be is how smaller and medium companies can help support the nerves, their use of Nerves Hub. So, so another area that I would love to dive into a little bit here is um, the kinds of things that people can do with Nerves. So uh, if, if someone is now thinking, oh, maybe I've had an idea for a project you know, maybe it's something they want to do around their house. It's a hobby project, or maybe it's an idea for a, uh, for a product that they would like to build. Um, can you give some idea of what kinds of things would nerves be good for? All right. So I think there's a sweet spot with nerves. The, uh, there are some kinds of devices that are way too, that are really simple. So if you're looking at a little Arduino, uh, an Arduino, and doing something very that's just very self-contained, no networking. That's that's great for that kind of device. Nerves is when you start thinking about nerves, it's just, you um, the best of the the most interesting devices have some smarts in, inside of them, so they need a little bit more processing power. They do a lot of networking, so you can start benefiting from the whole Elixir ecosystem. Um, and um, you want to have them, you know. It, building these devices out, they, you kind of want to stash them away. You know, they're kind of like put in the corner and you want to forget about them. That device just exists, does its job. Um, I think we've had a lot of examples of people, uh, devices that have done this, like just like modern systems to, um, for, I know that there have been several presentations on, like how do I want to control watering my yeah. different kind of home 
kind of drizzle two thousand. Yes, the drizzle exactly. Like it has a you want to have these things be self-contained because you know internet goes out, right? You still want it to do its thing. Um, I think that with the Drizzle 2000, there was uh, it was more than just a timer. <laughs> so a lot of this, these interesting devices, they they're more than just like a simple timer. Like you can implement a simple timer with an Arduino, but if you want to have some logic that can operate disconnected from the internet, where you, what do you want to write that in? And I think a lot of us would choose a higher level language like Elixir or Erlang. Um, and that would certainly make the project more enjoyable. Um, now, when you get to the whole networking side, uh, I think that's where a lot of the, the traditional embedded um, environments kind of start breaking apart, especially for a lot of uh, developers, which is just the whole idea of writing HTTP stacks or having web servers in C and C++. I think, while well, totally doable, I've done it. I had a medium level of enjoyment on it, but I have to say that uh, my enjoyment from working on that stuff in the Elixir and Beam languages is way, way, way higher. I think the other aspect of the Erlang VM that's also maybe not stressed as much is um, on a lot of these projects, you're pulling a lot of third-party apps. Like it's just not something that you can do, it's write everything. So you're pulling all this third-party software. And if you have want to build a reliable system out of a lot of other people's code, which I think a lot of us want to do, it's how do we how do we make sure that there's reliability in that code? And I think Elixir and Erlang has an answer to that. So by using uh these tools, you can you can do that with some sort of confidence. Yeah, I, I know that sometimes um, we in the community uh, we talk about like supervisors. Supervisors can be they're they're difficult sometimes to learn for people new to the new to the language, or they can be a little bit tricky to get right to make sure that your different failure scenarios right. are handled. But if you've ever tried to write something like supervisors in C, you know, like the subset of C that that compiles to an Arduino, it's it's tricky. It's real hard to get that right. <laughs> um, I, mean, I, I think that you build up a tremendous amount of appreciation for what um, the OTP team has done with supervision and the general structure and some of the decisions that they've made by doing this in other ways, in other languages. Um, certainly for me, that was really what pulled me over. I knew to Erlang and the Erlang and the Beam just because I knew I needed some of these features. Um, I had implemented part of them, but it is really tough, like really tough. Um, and I, I, if I were to have the same ones in other languages, I'd just give up and reboot the whole device, right? It's, <laughs> it's just, there is no fixing this. It's just reboot the whole device and carry on. Whereas uh, this supervision gives me a lever to uh, reduce the granularity and take some of these pieces, you know, have, keep the, most of the system running while, this, while we recover the small piece of it. I think that's incredibly valuable for a device that has uptime as a feature. Yeah, I um, a while ago I had a project that I was working on in my house. So I had a little Raspberry Pi in my upstairs, had a Raspberry Pi camera. And a Raspberry Pi camera is a little device where it gets both its power and all of its commands from the Raspberry Pi device itself. And so I had this, this project and I plugged it in, I, I built the firmware, I start running it. Um, you can do all sorts of fun things that I've never been able to, um, to do on, a, on an embedded project before. I was able to SSH in and have an IEX console. So I could like run commands in the language of my program inside the process of my program, which is really amazing for an embedded device to be able to say like, well, what kinds of values do I get? You know, like what does a frame look like if it's pointed this close to the sun versus this angle? And a lot of times that kind of thing is, is hard to reason about when you were kind of running some of the code on your laptop, some of the code on the device. Um, and so really cool things. And then one day I uh, opened up my web browser to see what my camera was seeing and it had black frames. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting. I wonder what's going on. And it turns out one of my kids had gone upstairs and unplugged the Raspberry Pi, or sorry, the Pi camera from the Raspberry Pi. And I, I just assumed that that would have crashed it because I didn't write any specific code. But just because I had started the Raspberry Pi camera from a supervisor, it had actually been slowly sitting there trying to restart it for I don't know how many hours. And when I plugged it back in, the website was running again. And for me, that was one of these moments of like, wow, uh, supervisors, even when I didn't put that much thought into them, did the, did the most sane thing that I could have imagined. 
uh, and definitely gave me more robustness than I would have had if I had written that code by hand. So um, I think that's, you know, there, there's a lot of power to leverage there in the underlying VM and the things that it tries to deliver for you uh, that you can add to an embedded project and it, it results in something kind of magical. Oh, yeah, yeah. I That experience is, is so common. And sometimes it's kind of amazing. Some of these devices that I look in the logs, I'm like, what happened here? You know, it's it, it's kind of... You know, the typical thing is something happened like over a weekend or sometime where you definitely don't want to work on it. And then, uh, you know, Monday, Tuesday, you look at the logs and you're like, what happened? There are all these restarts and all this, but there was no downtime or no detect or people didn't detect any downtime externally or didn't see anything. And you're like, wow, this is all these things, all these problems happened and the system worked itself out. And then, you know, next week you try to address why some of those problems happened because you prefer them not to, but uh, it is so nice <laughs> to not be put on the spot, you know, when, when something breaks to have the device try to heal itself. Yeah. This episode is sponsored by GitLab Commit. GitLab's inaugural user event brings together the GitLab community to connect, learn, and inspire. Speakers will showcase the power of DevOps in action through strategy and technology decisions, lessons learned, behind the scenes looks at the development life cycle and more. Learn how to innovate the future of software development by registering today. GitLab Commit Brooklyn, September 17th, and GitLab Commit London, October 9th. You can find it at devchat.tv slash GitLab Commit. Um, one other thing I wanted to make sure we touched on, so we touched on kind of nerves updates, nerves hub. Can we talk for just a minute about Elixir circuits? This is, this is a project that was fairly new to me. I think it's uh, a little over a year old now, if I understand correctly. Yes. Um, there's, a, there's a website for it, and it's a great place if you're, again, if you're wondering, like, what kinds of things can I hook to Raspberry Pi? Can I connect analog sensors to it? Can I, um, you know, can I control a motor? If any of those kinds of things that you're thinking about, Elixir Circuits, I think, is, would be a great place to start. But could you give us maybe an idea of what was your goal with that, uh, with that project? Well, so Elixir Circuits, if you, is, is really the version two of uh, a project called Elixir Ale. So people who have been around for a long time may be familiar with Elixir Ale. Uh, Elixir Ale, the whole point of the project was to let you talk to hardware devices from Elixir. And Elixir Ale had, was great at that. It had a number of limitations that through the years just couldn't be fixed, right? So it's, uh, there are too many projects using it. So what a few of us did was we, we took what we liked on Elixir Ale and rewrote it, rebranded it into Elixir Circuit. So that's effectively the 2.0. So it, if you have a hardware device that, that connects via GPIO, I2C, SPI, or UART, Elixir Circuits provides a way of getting at that. And the website also provides links to libraries that other people have written that use Elixir Circuits to talk to specific devices. So if you don't necessarily want to write the uh, code that interacts with a particular device, like, uh, for example, a humidity sensor or a GPS or whatever, you can go to Elixir Circuits and maybe find a library that does that for you so you can interact with it at a higher level standpoint. So going over the improvements for Elixir Circuits, Elixir Circuits is quite a bit faster than Elixir Ale. Uh, it uses, uh, it, we switched from ports to NIFs for Elixir Circuits. Um, it also has a few, a few features to make coding um, hardware a little bit friendlier, especially for I2C. Um, I2C, there's more helper functions to let you investigate what's going on in the bus, see kind of like what's out there kind of give you a little bit better um, experience based on what we had on Elixir Ale, especially if you need a hardware. The, the perhaps last thing to mention is it's, it's possible to uh, unit test with Elixir circuits. Elixir circuits will build for your Mac or your PC. And that will, um, while it's, you can't completely unit test against a hardware device that you don't have, you can kind of exercise a few of the APIs a little bit um, better in your own code and get a little bit more comfortable when you're developing. So that's that. Uh, the other part of Elixir Circuits I think is really interesting is the quick start. So on the website, if you go to the, quick, the Elixir Circuits quick start, there's, a, there's firmware that you can download. You don't have to build anything, no building at all, no installing nerves, nothing. All you do is you download the firmware, you copy it to a micro SD card for, 
for Raspberry Pis, any of the Raspberry Pis or the BeagleBone, the BeagleBone set of boards. You copy it there, it boots up, you get an IEX console, and you can type um, commands to interact with GPIO, I squared C, and SPI, play around with it. If you want to copy paste a Elixir module into the IEX prompt, you can do that and uh, kind of just uh, get a feel for how Elixir circuits works, how NERVS works, feels at, um, when you have it actually running on a device without any of the NERVS set up. <laughs> yes, so that was a long time needed. So there was a lot of cool stuff in there. And one of the things I heard uh, was talking about the switch between ports and NIFs. And that has been, I know, a, a topic of discussion in the community, in the Elixir community in, in general. And like uh, we talked with Matt Novak at Discord about how they were able to use NIFs to their benefit for Discord. Uh, and, and so people can check out that episode. But I would love to hear, like, it, it sounds like you have another project that helps you manage this. Uh, and I'd love to hear your kind of discussion about, like, uh, where, how you made the change and, and kind of your thought process there. Right, right. So, yes, ports and NIFs. Um, this has been a long process for me. So, one of the features of Erlang that I really liked, um, this was when I first got started with it, was that they had a model for integrating C and C++ code, right? It's, and it was a model that I really understood how they um, had reliability. So the idea was you write all your Erlang code, and then if you want to interact with a C program, you can do it through a port, which is an external process. You can supervise that process, and it will restart and get some of the benefits of working with Erlang, but at the same time, I can bring to the table all the C and C++ code that I've built up forever onto a project. And, uh, not, and it would integrate a way that I could understand would not lose this reliability. Because with most other languages, you have um, an FFI interface where if you, you, know, you make the call outs and sync process, things crash, then you're toast and, and you have to reboot or restart everything. That is definitely the feature that I did not want. So, I really understand and I appreciate the ports. Now, there's a problem with ports, and uh, they're slow, right? So the ports have this great interface. You can send messages to it through standard in and receive files, results back through standard out. Super simple, you know, conceptually, but it's not, too, it's not that fast. There's, you have to marshal everything and uh, demarshal it on the way back. Not a, um, and there's not really much that you can do to get around that fundamentally, except for increase the granularity. So the sweet spot, I think, for ports is if you have if you have something big that you want your C or C++ or whatever um, external code that you're writing to do. So for computer vision, for example, like run face detection and then get back to me, right? That's That would be the kind of level of thing that you'd want a port to do. You don't want a port to add 2 plus 2 for you. That's just silly. Um, so if you want to do a simple addition or something small and granulated, that's, that's really the domain of the NIF. And um, my, my preference is more towards put everything to ports that I possibly can, and then NIFs what I must, right? So um, that actually, so I have a, a port-based project called Muon Trap, which um, effectively lets you call existing C and C++ programs that aren't really, that don't integrate that can be called to be a port, but don't really follow some of the port uh, semantics. For example, ports quote, um, so ports, they, they want you to, um, to exit as soon as standard ends closed, right? Most C, existing C programs just don't do that. So Beyond Trap adds that capability. Beyond Trap also lets you do some interesting things with managing the resources ports use with C groups for Linux. Now the, uh, so I have that project that I, I like that that project I find incredibly useful, but moving back to Elixir circuits, why in the world did we switch to NIFs on Elixir circuits? And I think that was a combination of two things. Number one, Earth, Elixir AL effectively had almost, had very, very few reported crashes in the port, right? The port was just not causing problems. And if you looked at the actual code, it's not that substantial. It does very simple, mostly simple, just pretty harmless stuff, like reading writing files and, and using the select system call in certain ways that just don't crash that often. So you have five years of the thing not really crashing. You got to think to yourself, maybe, I, maybe it's time that I can pull this into a NIF. Um, 
the other thing that happened about that same time was uh, Erling OTP pulled in support for dirty NIFs, and that feature let the NIF block for a little bit. And that was a feature that was is pretty needed for this I.O. that we do with uh, Elixir circuits is some of the I.O.s go out and it's kind of slow because hardware, the hardware buses that uh, Elixir circuits uh, supports is a little bit slow in the big scheme of things. And uh, we didn't want to block the uh, Erlang VM while it's making those calls. So it seemed very appropriate to make that switch. There, having said that, there are things that I think that people can now do with Elixir circuits that were just not even conceivable with uh, Elixir AL. Uh, many of those are, are, have to do with devices that you need to toggle pins relatively quickly. So this was something that I just didn't want anyone ever to attempt with Elixir AL. And despite my efforts, people still did because no one wants to program in C. No one wants to enable that Linux device driver that already supports it, right? Because that stuff gets hairy and complex. The bugs are kind of hard to for a lot of people who don't have experience with uh, the low level Linux to kind of put their head around for what's going on. It's the idea of programming everything Elixir is very interesting. So why not just program everything with Elixir circuits? And that's what people are doing, but then getting sad because it was slow, like really slow. So the, uh, my hope is, is that there are a few more projects. I mean, we're not talking that Elixir circuits is fast by any stretch of the imagination. If, you, if there's an embedded systems programmer listening to this podcast, they're gonna be like, oh, it's still crazy slow. But it's fast enough that it's good, that uh, it can start enabling things like getting some information from accelerometers and gyros without a lot of pain, interacting with uh, these DHT11 humidity sensors, which have this very low level protocol for interacting with them. And so it's, it's these kind of little things that you want to do and just the level of effort to pull in the, the Linux drivers and whatnot that you normally would do is just enough that, uh, that this is, I think that this will be hugely valuable to a lot of people. So I, I think it's very interesting, this uh, idea of this library muon trap. And I'd love to hear if you feel this is a library that could help other people who are perhaps not working with nerves, but maybe want to uh, control access to NIFs or something like that. Yes. I, it, it totally can. Yes. I use it and it's good. Cool. I had heard that a few people use this outside of the nerves comp, um, context and I love that. And I'd love to, uh, I think a particularly interesting part of it is the C groups use. Um, so this is, this is kind of getting a very lightweight, uh, way of getting memory controls and CPU controls on your ports. So, right. You, you run the C code, um, externally and, the whole reason to use ports is that you don't want them to mess up the Erlang VM, but there are many ways of messing up the Erlang VM. One is going out of control CPU wise, going out of control with memory and that. And uh, Muon Trap gives you an option for, for integrating with the uh, Linux C groups to put constraints on those two. Yeah, I think that's actually like, it's not something I would have gone to the effort of doing, but it was obviously a thing you ought to do. Like you need not to use up all the scheduler CPU and have it swapping. Right. And so the, the other thing which is which uh, kind of kills me a little bit is a lot of these C programs, they like to uh, spawn child processes, and right? How do you, you know, if you have something that spawns just lots of child processes and you have it on for a really long time and that program doesn't keep good track of them, and I, maybe this is, is more of an embedded device thing. Like sometimes I log into the device, I run PS and I like get this laundry list of processes that are just running. I got my, embed, my poor little embedded device, which is already resource star, and now I have like a hundred of these processes, which are totally useless. Um, and uh, I don't know what they're doing. They're kind of like, they're kind of just sitting there idle, but I don't like it. So um, the, uh, the C groups lets you track those children, even if uh, they do, the programs that you're running do evil stuff like demonize, you know, uh, um, which is disassociating the children from itself. Those Linux is good with keeping track of those PIDs. Now, this is not something unique to me on Trap. Uh, System D does this too. Docker certainly can contain all this stuff, but it's uh, really nice to have it for me in this lightweight package. So, how does this compare? So, I've used. Um, I only ever need to launch like single commands, like pretty much image magic. Um, so, I've used Porcelain for that. Like, is this is Muon Trap something I could use instead, or is it more geared towards the the daemon stuff? It, so the intention for me is, is more towards the team, the long running processes, right? So it doesn't support some nice features that Porcelain has. Like if you want to interact with your program a lot, you're going to 
not be happy with Neon Trap. Neon Trap is more. I have this, you know, somebody gave me this uh, this big C or C++ server, and I know I need to run it in parallel because it handles some important service that I interact with internally. And at the beginning of my Elixir program, I'm going to start it. I'm going to supervise it because, you know, it might crash or something like that, and then interact with it through maybe it has a socket or, or some other way of interfacing to it that's not through standard and standard out. Like, uh, um, I think I think my view of uh, porcelain is that it makes uh, these one-off commands is very nice and easy. So there's, now you can use me on trap for one-off commands too. Um, I, and, and a few people do that. I think that it starts getting more interesting if that C groups functionality uh, is beneficial. Well, that is very cool. Thank you for that inf information, on, especially on Muon Trap. It's something like, um, while I am not doing Nerves development actively, I think this is something that's like, wow, I, I might still have a, a beneficial use for this. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I know Michael is also very much active in the Nerves community. He runs a Nerves focused uh, meetup. And so I'm, I'm glad that he's on here. He can speak to that specifically. Yeah, I mean, I just have to say, I actually wasn't aware of Muon Trap. So as much as I play around with nerves, um, so I'm a hobbyist. I haven't ever had a, a nerves job yet, but um, it's, it's on my bucket list. So definitely will be coming at some point. But um, I, I actually think Muon Trap would have been an awesome tool for me in some cases when deploying server side code, because there are times that I'm interacting with some sort of C program where I want to delegate the you know the number crunching part of it or or maybe it's something that's it, you know it's a it's an optimized data structure like a, a patricia tree or, tree or something like that and if i wanted to implement that in another language but again give it you know memory constraints and things along those lines uh that, that's a pretty amazing project um you know and again it feels like frank somehow keeps hitting this sweet spot of yeah there's so many times that i've heard people say oh why do we need kubernetes actually Elixir gives us like a really amazing control plane. And yeah, like I can kind of imagine myself building a system where Elixir is actually starting a bunch of things with Muon Trap and monitoring them and making sure that they're healthy and, you know, and, and not exceeding certain limits. So that's, it's, it's a pretty amazing set of tools. Um, another thing that uh, I would love to hear a little bit about um, from Frank is the GRISP board. So, um, I know a little bit, GRISP is, uh, it's a totally separate project. Um, it's um, part, of, part of the idea of it is that you can just kind of write Erlang directly for this hardware. You don't need a Linux operating system there at all. But the GRISP2 board, I think, also does support NERVs. So you can have a Linux operating system and kind of the normal NERVs packaging. I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm wrong on some of these details. Ner uh, Frank, can you, can you give us a little more... Right. idea of what that project is. Yeah, so um, GRISP is a very similar project um, to NERVs in some extent that focuses Erlang. Now, they run the Erlang VM on embedded hardware. They have a, their own particular board, the GRISP a version one board, and all their tooling is for that board. And their, their also approaches is, uh, is to not use the Linux, like you mentioned, to use RTEMs. So this their code runs very close to the actual hardware, which is pretty interesting. Now, what they, the GRISP one, the current GRISP board, is uses a microcontroller, and it's just a little bit too small to run nerves on. But GRISP two, which was um, which was posted on Kickstarter a few months ago, and it was a successful Kickstarter, so it, it's funded. Um, now the 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 GRISP2 is in production or is, is being built out right now. Um, it's going to be delivered in October. And this board runs, has a processor that can run Linux, so it can run NERVs. Uh, I have a, I do not have a GRISP2 board yet, but I hope to get one soon. Um, I have another board that's very similar to it. And we have a, a NERVs, a prototype NERVs port to that board. So the hope is that when the GRISP2 is delivered, I think in October, that uh, uh, a few of us who have who have gotten these can um, push nerves over the edge for getting the port there, kind of exercising the hardware so we can get all the nice peripherals that are, are on it and have something to show, hopefully by Gig City Elixir. So that's either that it'll be either depending on when the hardware gets delivered, it'll either be unboxing 
or demo demonstrations at Gig City Elixir. That's mid October, and it's this to me is very exciting. Um, this uh, the hardware that's in the Crisp two is uh, resonates very well with a lot of industrial use cases. So the standard nerves on. Uh, Nerve projects run on the Raspberry Pi, which certainly can be used commercially. The BeagleBone series definitely are used commercially. I'm very familiar. The uh, the IMX that um, processor that's on the Crisp two is has just a ton of industrial users that will be interested in this. So I think this is a very valuable port for the future of nerves. Yeah, it looks really interesting just to, in the difference of approach. Um, I, I really loved early on, uh, again, as like a hobbyist, I loved the fact that Nerves has a really great story for getting up and running on a Raspberry Pi. Um, and so for, for people who haven't done it before, if, if you're ever thinking to yourself like, oh, could I do a Nerves project? What would it take? Um, for $15, you can order a Raspberry Pi Zero with wireless uh, internet on it. And uh, you buy that and the cheapest SD, micro SD card you can find on Amazon. All of them will have plenty of capacity for what you actually use with Nerves. A uh, typical Nerves bundle ends up being like 35 megabytes. So you definitely will not run out of space. Um, and you, know, you do that and you have enough to get your Nerves project up and off the ground and start doing things. And then you choose, oh, add some LEDs. Those are a couple of bucks for a thousand of them on Amazon or whatever. Uh, another great place to start if people are interested. Uh, I, I absolutely love a project called Blink Chain, which uh, Greg Mefford um, publishes. And uh, besides having the best package name I've ever seen anywhere, Blink Chain, uh, it's, it makes it really easy if you buy one of these kind of like matrices of RGB LEDs. And you can start like, you know, scrolling letters across it. You can make all sorts of interesting animations, um, you know, and, and Frank is, uh, you know, he's talking about the limitations. There are definitely speed limitations to take into account, but I, I've written projects that read sensors from a Roomba 60 times a second. And I was using like 15% CPU on a Raspberry Pi. And so this is not, it's not an insane level of performance that you need. Um, for a lot of things, you know, reading your, reading your sensor 60 times a second is definitely enough to avoid crashing into walls. So uh, there's a lot you can do with that, that tool set. And then the fact that it's not specific to a piece of hardware, you can write a nerves project that runs on x86 hardware. So if you want to make like a, uh, you know, maybe a, a, a terminal that sits on a desk somewhere for people to sign into or something like that, you can use x86 hardware and that has like a touch screen and you can write a nerves project that runs on that. You don't have to worry about, uh, you know, windows auto updating and messing up your program or other things. It's your program runs the whole device. That's a really cool use case. You can buy a BeagleBone black and then you can take the, you know, the open hardware designs for BeagleBone and um, add your own designs to that. So you integrate your sensors, send that off to a manufacturer and get a run of custom hardware made that runs nerves on your hardware with your sensors built in. That's, uh, you know, so again, like if you're doing kind of prototyping or maybe you're trying to spin up a new device, there's, there's so many cool things where nerves fits all the way from that, oh, I'm just a hobbyist, like I just want to get something working. I want to play with the world of embedded devices all the way through full production systems that, that people are doing with it. So um, I really love that breadth. But it, but it is very interesting to me to hear about something like Grisp, which, which sounds like there's a whole other world of people who don't even know about Erling and Elixir, probably for the most part, but are building and shipping these embedded devices um, with these kinds of processors and this kind of hardware that are going into factories and distilleries and who knows what kind of places that I've never been and I don't know anything about their world. And, and maybe this helps to bridge these two communities closer together a little. Oh, yeah. I Really hope so. I and believe so. The there is a lot of embedded hardware inside these factories and uh, warehouses. It's just it's a very useful kind of device to have, and a lot of this just has to be custom built because the problems are custom to that particular factory or custom to uh, the warehouse. That you know, this is like Latote. Latote um, outfits their warehouses with nerve based devices, and like you were talking about with the the kiosks, so they run. They manage um, kiosks. You know, they have a web, um, a small web browser in them that uh, 
they use throughout the factory. That's the firmware updates are all done through Nerf's Hub. So when they have some new low level piece of hardware that they want to attach, like some new scanner for their equipment or or some other actuator that they need to plug in, they'll send out a firmware update, have someone plug it into uh, their Raspberry Pi or their uh, x86 kiosk computer, and then it will just it'll just work. This is uh, they found this to be a very useful way of managing their devices as opposed to having like a custom like a Raspbian or Debian uh, distribution that's not quite as managed at the bit per bit level. <laughs> so notice that everything when you push out these updates, it's the whole device that you image, you know, all the software, and that's. Uh, that can be a very valuable way of ensuring that everything in your factory, whatever, is running the exact set of code that you want when you want it. So there are a lot of uses. I think it's this this whole world is very hidden from a lot of people about how much factory warehouse industrial controls embedded embedded controls how how much there is to that. Yeah, I know of a, a local company who is looking at to use nerves for the restaurant industry where you're having temperature sensors on all the different units like the refrigerators and the humidity sensors. And that would all collect back to like a, a, a nerves device at the, at the restaurant, which would then connect back up to the cloud and, you know, uh, shuttle the information and everything. So, yeah, I think there are a lot of places that are kind of hidden from normal view. Right. Oh, actually you had a great example. There's are at least two companies that I'm aware of that uh, in the restaurant industry that uh, use it to automate restaurants. So there's uh, uh, before I heard about this, I had not appreciated how much automation there is between the uh, the point of service um, terminal where you place your order to what's being shown to the cooks to being what's being gotten from inventory to the predictive models for you know should we start warming up or taking care of stuff or you know setting up based on on these statistics for Thursday at 4 p.m. or you know what have you. There's like there is a just uh, incredible sophistication to those devices. And two of them, I know, at least run early um, inside them. Sadly, not running nerves, but uh, still, I thought that it was very interesting that they chose Erlang to, for, to, for doing the orchestration and writing much of their software. That's cool. We've been recording Ruby Rogue since 2011, and we've talked to a lot of people who have had a really deep influence, not only on the programming community, but also on the Ruby community. And as we've talked to these people, it's become apparent to me that we talk a lot about the things that make them interesting that they've done. But we don't really get into how they got into programming or how they came up in their career, how they got to be the person who invented whatever library or, or technique that they came on the show to talk about. And so I put together a show where we actually highlight these things. We talk to them about how they got into programming. We talk to them about how they got into Ruby, maybe how they got into Rails. We get a little bit deep into what makes them tick and why they are the way they are. And then we talk about what they're working on. We talk about the things that make them well known or make them interesting. And a lot of times it's the stuff that goes beyond the code that really makes these people tick and makes them the kind of people that we want to hear about. And so I put together a show called My Ruby Story. You can find it at myrubystory.com. And it's where I interview these people and just get the stories of these people and how they came into programming. So if you want to hear inspirational stories or get ideas on how you can actually advance your career, then go check it out at myrubystory.com. Now, I imagine with all this, uh, you know, you have these distributed devices, there's this networking that's all there. And I know you've done some recent work on a new network library and you're solving some specific problems. Can you speak to that? Right. So the new library is called VintageNet. So the, uh, the currently, if you start with NERVS, so you get NERVS Network and... Um, there's network lets you do things like set up wired Ethernet, uh, get DHCP addresses for your for your network uh, interface, do Wi-Fi, try to do a bunch of hub, uh, access points, switch between them. It can do stuff like it can support uh, virtual Ethernet through a USB cable, so you can do this this one cable power Ethernet to a console um, setup that we do on the Raspberry Pi Zeros, which is very convenient for our development. Um, so it uses that. The um, Nurse Network has a number of limitations that uh, a few of us have been running into with our jobs and in the community. VintageNet is stop, addresses many of those. One of the, the the interesting ones to me, or at least the most interesting one to me, probably Michael will step in and give the you know the better marketing spend was multi-home juice. <laughs> so so I will try on this. So multi-home juice is say you have wired Ethernet, 
you have Wi-Fi, you have an LTE modem. Now, all three work, right? But the LTE modem is slow and it costs you money. So if you don't have to use it, you don't want to use it. Um, there's kind of a preference on how this. So before um, VintageNet, we didn't give any kind of support in this area where you could have multiple interfaces and have the networking layer choose between them and fail back and forth. VintageNet gives you that option. It will check for internet connectivity when something goes down, it can go to the other one. You can set up multiple access points if you have a device that has a preferred access point and the secondary backup one that it can go to. It can do that. So these things are really nice when you start putting devices in hard to reach locations and because you never want them to be disconnected, right? They're, there's, you, with um, this set of devices, it's their ability to stay online is just completely critical for, for these applications. And the device has to be able to figure out a way of getting online on its own. Um, because if it's not online, you can't tell it. It's like without sending someone on a truck or flying out to whatever location that you put these devices, there's just nothing you can do. Uh, so this, this kind of functionality was being built out again, by um, some people in, in the community independently. And to, where look, VintageNet is a project where um, a few of us are putting it together in one place so they can be more of an out-of-the-box experience with nerves. Now, having said that this, to the hobbyist, this multi-home juice may be less interesting, but I think the other pieces that, that might be more interesting to someone getting started with nerves is the ability to, for example, it will persist Wi-Fi settings. You can choose not to have the library persist them for you, but if you're just doing little stuff with nerves, it is so nice to just be able to say, okay, device, I put you here. This is gonna, let me set the access point and then just sleep and the library will remember it the next time it reboots. Like that's, it sounds simple, but like if you're making a device from, if you're just getting started with nerves and you build a device and you, and you, you quickly see that you can hard code the access point very easily, but changing it at runtime, you have to start adding a couple pieces. That gets old. Um, that's kind of a downer when you have a project. So we pulled that in. Uh, we pulled in uh, a little bit better way of giving notifications to applications. So there's this particular issue we have with nerves, and that's the, that the network is not available. So for a lot of people coming to nerves, they're used to a server environment where at least the ethernet cable's connected right to the server. Like how many times do you ever start a server and someone still needs to plug in the ethernet cable? Like that's, Sounds silly, but for our nurse device, that happens a lot. And the cable gets disconnected, you know, just all kinds of random stuff. So you have, you're trying to use somebody's library and they assume internet connectivity with their library. I mean, how do you even, how does it even work in the nurse environment when the network's coming and going? They, so you have to write some glue code if, unless you control this library to tell when the networking's there or not. And that was, I, will, I, I don't want to say it's hard, but it's a, it's a decent amount of, thinking that you have to do to get something that should be simple. So we have some help with that in there. And then the other piece that we're helping, that we're hoping this helps out is that uh, we took the strategy with Nerf's network to build out a lot of networking logic in Elixir, which seemed great at the time, except when you add, want to add some new kind of networking technology and you're coming from an embedded Linux world that already has the programs built out. We didn't give a way of just pulling in, you know, the, uh, the ability to just call those programs. So say you have an LTE modem that just that the manufacturer just gives you just a, a gives you scripts and just tells you to run this, right? It would be great if that were integrated with the, the overall networking stack so that everyone would think could be managed in the same place. That didn't doesn't exist with Nerf's network. What people would do is just have a completely separate LTE library to manage that. And uh, we're hoping to bring this in so that these higher level kinds of ideas, like being able to notify applications that don't know about networking when their things are available, can you know these new technologies can do that um, because the framework supports it. And for the routing, the failback, the vintage net can handle that failback because that's a global thing. The routing tables for that particular feature need to be managed globally. So having these uh, these other networking technologies be able to hook into that is is very beneficial. So VintageNet is currently under development. If you if you don't mind the bleeding edge, it totally works. But if you don't want to get burnt, maybe give us a little bit more time. We're building up documentation. We have examples. It is uh, 
there's a vintage net example, which replaces what you get by default. So the NERSC new project generators generate things that use NERSC networking, which well, you obviously can't use if you're using vintage net. They don't work together. So you have to do a little bit more work on your own. But uh, it's definitely something to look into, especially if you especially if you're working on a product that has this multi-home use case, because doing that case makes is very difficult to to support with NERSC network. I want to put a Raspberry Pi on a pole on my property and I don't want to ever climb that pole again. <laughs> yep, absolutely. <laughs> you so, built the feature for that. Yes, yes. So, um, got to have a squirrel proof cage and everything. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's serious. No one wants to go fetch and, and hit the reboot button on these devices. So, Nerfs Hub has a remote reboot. So, long as the, you know, the, the device can connect to the network, you can actually. If you enable it, you can you can press a button and nurse up to reboot it. Sometimes that gets you out of trouble. Uh, there's actually another feature that I, I did uh, that I think is really super cool. It's not a nurse specific thing, but we exposed it. It's called the RAM loops logger. I'll have to supply a link. So the idea is, is that you have this that you can get your log messages back from a previous reboot. So something goes wrong on you know on your nurse device on this poll. It has no network, no way of telling you anything. It reboots and you're like, what happened? What happened? How do I get this? Well, this this uh, this feature called the RAM Oops Logger, and there's uh, there's a Lixer package for doing this, and you can actually look to see what the log was before it rebooted. It like looks at old DRAM. Oh, so when you reboot, you know you, you normally think that all DRAM gets wiped. Well, that is not true. It actually reserves a particular place in memory for for the for your logs. The Lixer log logger, you can be routed to go there. And list this place in memory. The DRAM cells haven't faded because you know if you the way DRAM works is if you unplug it, it'll eventually fade. It's not persistent. But when you reboot, it won't have faded. Um, and if you don't reboot for, um, if you lose power for like if power glitches, like just for sharp, it, it most likely the cells will be there, so it can recover those. And it even does neat things like if the power glitches for like a fraction of a second, so. The, a couple of the bits, you lose a couple of the bits, it has air correction codes that recovers what's there. So I have never seen it recover perfectly, but you can still read the logs and, and you feel super cool when you can see these logs and they're kind of in this, uh, you know, the, the TV hacker style where they're kind of, they look corrupt, but you can actually read them and get some information like <laughs> what was wrong. Yeah, so is it a requirement that you wear a black leather jacket while doing this? Absolutely. <laughs> That is a so, super cool hardware hack. Yeah, so this is totally a Linux thing. I can't take any credit for it, but it is it's like one of these really neat gems that Linux has mm -hmm. and that uh, that we expose. So I, I just love so much, you know, the, this world of nerves, um, you know, and in AWS, I've literally never wondered whether a mouse is going to chew through the power or networking cable of my server, right? Like there's the, all these problems that don't exist. Um, but I was talking to a friend recently, and, and so his company builds a product where um, they install some cameras in a car service center, and they take pictures of cars as they're coming in and as they're going out, and they use license plate matching to figure out that if somebody calls in and says, hey, I got a, you know, a dent in my car while it was at your service station, they can check, oh, yeah, was the dent there when it came in? Was the dent there when it left? Kind of thing. Um, and so he's telling me about all the tooling. I mean, they have, you know, years of work into tooling around making sure that things don't go down, that things can recover, what happens if, you know, that they are using whatever ISP that um, service center is using, but lots of people use really bad ISPs and they, they can't just tell all their customers to get good ISPs. Um, and, and so he's talking about the same problem that sometimes the network goes down and while the network's down, they can't do anything for that customer. And I was thinking, wow, it'd be really amazing if he could have like a 2G chip, right? So if anyone hasn't used these before, you can actually get these little 2G modems. They go over a bunch of cell network stuff. Like 2G actually has crazy, crazy range. And all the hardware is still sitting there installed from back when we all had like flip phones. Um, but the bandwidth is terrible. And most of the time you don't want to use it. Well, with vintage net, what if you could basically say, hey, always be streaming things back up to the cloud and doing your analysis, but if ever it goes down, let things buffer up for a little while, keep you know some small history locally, and now just connect to 2G to give status updates. And you, you can like 
you can give an update on what's happening in the garage, even if you can't be streaming live video back to your servers or back to a user somewhere. And that's a really powerful set of tools to have. So actually, Frank, I got to say, your marketing was way better on this one. Vintage Net, you sold it really good. I was like, I'm like sitting here nodding my head. I'm into this. Uh, and, um, you know, but again, I just think if I, I, can't, I just can't encourage people enough. If you've never done anything in the embedded space, just get a Raspberry Pi Zero, get a couple of LEDs, you know, maybe get a beeper or some buttons or, or whatever kind of peripherals you're, you're interested in, humidity, temperature, whatever sensors you're thinking about, and just start playing because it will cause you to think differently about programming, right? We, we talk about that a lot in terms of learning a new language. The same thing is true about learning the difference between writing a program where you're going to stick it on the top of a 50-foot pole that you never want to climb again, or, uh, you know, I had one that was in my uh, garden, and you know, I was trying to measure uh, temper, like soil moisture and soil temperature. And I mean, so it turned out I was trying to do all these controlled experiments so that I could outgrow my wife, but she completely demolished me. All of my plants died. There's more to growing plants than technology, it turns out. But it was amazingly fun and is totally causing me to write different kinds of code when I do deploy to AWS or whatever normal day-to-day -day job that I have. So. If you're learning to, if you're looking to expand your boundaries as a programmer and as an engineer, embedded systems is a very different world and presents a bunch of different challenges that will force you to do things differently. Yeah, for sure. I love it when more people come over. The I have to say, I, I come from the embedded background, and the influx of people from other um, communities, back end, front end, whatever, is just incredibly beneficial. Everyone, it. It's been it's really enjoyable, you know, to see what uh, people bring in with them because the embedded field kind of has these different constraints, like you said, um, but it just doesn't move as fast as many of these other fields, and they're very interesting things that people are contributing to the NERVS community. Uh, the Elixir, for example, with the tooling is and. Um, some of the libraries has just been fantastic. So awesome. Well, that is probably a good place for us to transition to picks. Josh, do you have something? You know, I do this time, and it's a little may be unusual, but it's the 2017 National Electric Code on archive.org because if you go looking for the National Electric Code, Electrical Code, uh, you will get the vendor that makes this thing and you can register for an account and then read it in a very crappy flash reader on their website that's not actually useful for free. <laughs> or you get really fed up with it and say, you know what, about archive.org has this thing. And then you want to share that link with people so they can save the day and a half that they spent reading the stupid flash thing. So that is my pick. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Eric, do you have something? Yeah. So I've got, um, <clears throat> there's a, uh, a book called Parsley. So that's a uh, parse as in like computer parsing Lee. Um, that is a way to play text adventures in a group setting like on a tabletop. So you'd have, you have your book and, I, and when you look at the, the pictures of it, um, like it looks like a really old school kind of like King's quest type style text adventure. Um, and so you, you, as a dungeon master, I guess in, in quotes, will read, read out the adventure and then people have a list of commands that they can do. Um, so it's like, you're at a cottage, you're standing in a small cottage, there's a fishing pole, a door leads outside. And then there's like, things that you can do and like it's pretty much a choose event choose your own adventure but it's like a game i guess more so than than uh just reading a book and like following around um so that's pretty cool uh i know they that gets run at gen con every year so that would that just happened um and i think i heard some stories about like really young kids learning about these text adventures and like what a floppy disk is because of like of that. Cause I think that the, the save icon or whatever is, is of course a floppy. Um, and my second pick is the big elixir. Um, so I'll be speaking at the big elixir this year. It's coming up in November. Um, so yeah, go, go check it out. It's a really cool conference down in new Orleans. Um, so yeah. Cool. And Michael. I got too many picks this week, um, but I'll go through them pretty fast. So first, a uh, talk by Garth Hitchens. So he worked at a company that shipped an early device built on top of nerves. And he talks about their, um, their process of selecting, uh, of kind of making that choice and the competitive advantages that it gave to them for shipping a product. 
really, really cool talk. One of the things that early on got me really interested in NERFs. Um, then uh, Tim Mecklem gave a talk a little while ago, so just a couple of years ago, about building an artificial pancreas. And so this is, a, this is not like a for-profit project. This is sort of a, hey, this might literally change the world for a lot of people who are dealing with things like insulin pumps. And um, he's talking about potentially building a closed closed loop feedback system for helping to regulate your blood sugar for um, people who live with diabetes. And so uh, amazing to see the level of reach here that NERVS has. And then as just a final counterpoint to that, uh, a link for when John Karstens talks about dad engineering with NERVS. And this is just like doing fun projects around the house that involve kids and devices and NERVS. Um, to give you an idea of what it looks like from a hobbyist perspective. So I wanted to highlight those three talks. It's, it would obviously be a decent amount of time to watch all three of them, but if you're interested in any one of those kind of very professional uh, or more like a change the world or just a hobby project, those are great, great places to start. And then finally, I had a friend recently who was telling me that they moved to a new house. He wanted the ability to open his fence from, uh, from inside of his house and, uh, and I started looking around because, uh, you know, I was, of course, telling him he should do his nerves, but his gate isn't very close to a power outlet. Um, and there are now a bunch of systems that exist. Um, so I'm linking to one, uh, but there's several of these from other manufacturers, and they are basically a small solar panel, uh, a battery, and a USB power outlet. And what that gives you is USB power, which happens to work very well with things like Beagle Bones or Raspberry Pis. And the battery that comes on board with this thing is enough to power Raspberry Pi Zero for around 26 straight hours. And so you could go put this somewhere, spend a little bit of money, and you actually now have like a solar powered, always on device uh, with nerves. And so that looks super cool. I am now actively looking for some remote location to put a device somewhere to do something. Uh, or potentially I have this idea of building a rover that will literally just go explore out in the world. Uh, indefinitely, and I just want to see how long it keeps phoning home whenever it encounters an open Wi-Fi. It'll probably just get run over by a car in the first day, but um, but that's my idea. So uh, I'm taking that rover. <laughs> if it goes down by Josh's house, I'll, I'll tell it to steer clear. Uh, but anyway, just amazing what you can do with nerves. Uh, so a big plug there. And those are my picks. Awesome. All right. So uh, mine is uh, Sasha Yurik uh, on Twitter was recently talking about a new library that he was experimenting with. And this was considered experimental. But it was a library called Boundaries. And it was this whole idea about in the community, we've been talking about um, umbrella applications and how to divide code like Phoenix contexts and, and how to uh, enforce separation and good coding practices, especially when you have larger teams and you're not able to uh, oversee and say, well, we don't want you to be reaching down into the depths of this other namespace. And so it's this uh, library that he's exploring and it's worth checking out if nothing else, just because it is a technological curiosity for me because it's, it's implemented using a custom compiler extension. So in, the, in your Mixi.xs, you can set up uh, additional, like a chain of compilers to be uh, used. And it's, it's an incorporating a custom compiler extension that reads a configuration that says, we're allowed to export this module uh, from this, uh, namespace and and the, it's allowed to be shared and it does a compile time check to make sure that you're not using something that you've declared cannot be used and so I thought it started to make me think like huh what other kind of features could we build that way just like that we're hooking into a compiler at that level and you know that we, that I thought was so how cool is that just that with Elixir we have this like chain of compilers and we can hook in a custom one I don't, I don't know it's just kind of blowing my mind so it's a library I'm looking forward to seeing more of and see what happens there. All right, Frank, what do you have? All right, so I first wanted to plug a library that uh, when I heard Michael talk about the solar battery project, and that's uh, Chris Breeze's power control library. So if you want that uh, power to last a little longer, so Chris Breeze has been experimenting with uh, um, power management, in particular on some Raspberry Pis to lower, uh, lower their use. So. Maybe you can get more than 26 hours out of this thing with this library. So I want to post it there. The, my, so getting to my pick, my pick is uh, this book called uh, Programming Boot Sector Games. So I'm, I'm currently reading through it and this book is just a crazy amount of fun for me. Um, the, uh, the idea 
and it's uh, and you and you kind of have to rewind to the 1980s, I think, um, to to when uh, people had floppy disks and the floppy disks have boot sectors. The boot sector is 512 bytes and contains just a little bit of executable code. Uh, so this this book it's published is I think it's just published a month ago or so. It's it's very new um, and it talks about how to write short assembly language x86 assembly language games that can be stored in a boot sector on a floppy map drive and booted up on in an old school IBM PC. Now you'd run it with um, Quemu or some other emulator. Uh, but what's really particularly fascinating is that you know you take 512 bytes and it's not 512 bytes that you get like how can you do much at all? Well this person he uh, he starts from you know simple game that you can kind of imagine which is like tic-tac-toe. Okay, you can implement that in 512 bytes and then goes on to Space Invaders and Pac-Man. And it's like not just like a lame version of Space Invaders and Pac-Man. It actually works. You use keys to navigate around, has little graphics, and it's incredibly fun to read how um, how Oscar uh, um, Toledo, uh, he, how he is able to crunch all this all this code to fit inside a boot sector with that constraint. He's quite an extraordinary programmer and it's just a totally fun book. So highly recommend. Very cool. There's a lot of good picks there. I'm sure it's uh, some good homework for you, dear listener, to go check out your favorite ones. Uh, but Frank, this has been really fun and it's been a great opportunity to catch up and hear about some of the incredible things that are happening in the Nerf space. So thank you for coming on and talking with us. Thanks so much for having me. This was a ton of fun. Thank you. Well, if people would like to follow you online, kind of hear what's going on new, uh, how should they reach out or contact you? So I'm on Twitter at FHumlet, the Twitter, GitHub, all the NERFS projects. We uh, both, Justin and I, actively monitor the issues list. So if you have some problems, you'll see something maybe a little bit less so during Elixir Comp. But uh, we definitely try to get those. And then the NERFS uh, NERF project Slack, uh, you'll find me there a lot. And I also uh, um, respond to any trouble people have on the Elixir uh, forum. Great. Well, I'm looking forward to Elixir Conf and when after that's over and this will it'll already have been after this goes live, but uh, I'm sure we're looking forward to sharing some of our favorite talks online uh, as, when those become available. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening and we hope you'll join us next week on Elixir Mix. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly 